feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank. Welcome back to another episode of The Shrimp Tank. We come to you virtually from Seattle and the entire great Pacific Northwest we lovingly call the PNW. If you want to learn how to start, grow, or run a successful business, this right here, this is the podcast for you. This is where we say street smarts and book smarts collide. Hello again, everyone. I'm Dan Whedon, and I don't have a co-host today. I'm flying solo, and I'm excited because I have an old friend. Our guest today is Ryan Oliver. Ryan is the author of the fantasy adventure series, Beasts of Men and Gods. Currently, two of, those, two of his books have been published within this grand fable. Ryan's inspiration for writing and storytelling originated from years of studying history and reading great works of fiction. I was a history major, so we may dive into that uh, sometime during this. Uh, Ryan aspires to improve his craft to bring wonderful new tales to the world. Ryan also works, he has a day job. He works as a safety instructor with the Department of the Navy and is aspiring to develop his work as an author, a speaker, and we're gonna talk about this, as a writing coach. He also produces an interview style podcast named Mighty Books, which features authors of every genre from all around the United States States each and every week, and I happen to have been one of them. We may talk about that too. Ryan and his wife live with their two sons in Bremerton, Washington. Ryan, welcome. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Be with you in just a second. Everyone, you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. We're on iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and YouTube. I like to tell everybody we are ubiquitous. Uh, we are actually at this point, my understanding is we are the number three entrepreneur podcast on iHeartRadio. I don't know, maybe there's only three of us, Ryan, uh, but we are number three and, and looking to try to, to move up that line. Like I said, normally I have a co-host with me that we are going to do a little banter, but we're not going to banter. I'm going to dive right in to talking to Ryan, uh, who I've, I knew when he was a little kid and now he's he's completely grown up he's got little kids of his own and he's doing incredibly cool things writing ryan welcome to the show thanks dan for having me uh it's an honor to be here well it's an honor to have you and and you know i i thought of you uh for this podcast because you're an author and and i know we're an entrepreneur podcast but i'm going to tell you ryan i'm i'm a believer that what you're doing is very entrepreneurial. You've you've carved out time away from a full time job, which is is cool. I, I love side hustles, and this is really it's it's probably a full time side hustle. You've carved out out time from that. You've carved out time away from your your young and growing family, and now you're even looking at maybe diving into some coaching. What I'd like you to do is go back in time. How did this love of writing and this desire to be an author, where did this start? And, and talk about your journey. So, I mean, I guess it started way back when I was pretty darn, pretty darn little, um, as, as young as I want to say even four or five. So preschool, kindergarten time frame. Um, I was always the one telling stories, uh, <laughs> sometimes make believe, sometimes they didn't sound so make believe. And I got in trouble quite a bit for making up uh, not so are very believable stories. So uh, when school hit, uh, about third third grade, we had an author show up to school, and it was a whole a whole event, a whole day event. We all assembled in the gym. There was you know several hundred of us kids sit on the floor there, and the authors reading to us their story. And I thought it was just really cool that we had a you know amazing event happening. We go back to our classrooms, and the author actually was going around and chatting with everybody about how he did it, how he became an author. And I thought it was really neat that, you know, you can create anything, any story you want. You are the maker of this world. And I just, I really took that to heart. And so we started doing little projects for writing and everything. I always had a lot more to say. My grandmother always told me I had the gift of gab and it kind of translated <laughs> to, to writing as well. And so as, as I got older, I started writing more and more uh, stories would come up from uh, just school and, and various things like that would come up with interesting characters and ideas. I had all sorts of ideas just running around in my head. Uh, well, I would say around 
13, 14 years old, uh, started getting into history more. Um, just it was always interesting to see how and why people did the things they did. So I started researching more and more, got into various social sciences like anthropology, sociology, history, uh, some psychology a little bit. And uh, started reading wonderful, you know, novels and different watching great movies, uh, fantasy adventure, uh, epic tales, if you will. And I would say the combination of uh, history and going down like the ancient Romans and um, Mayans, and I mean, world history, ancient world history. And then uh, it was always interesting. And what really hit me was in sociology, anthropology, talking about how leaders led huge groups of people and influenced great groups of people. And usually they did it by faith or religion or some other form of like, you know, authoritarianism, all that kind of stuff. A lot of different stuff. There was a movie that came out, Kingdom of Heaven, back in 2005. Um, uh, Ava Green, uh, Orlando Bloom, it's uh, all, that's the, the star, the stars. They, uh, it's based off the Crusades. And mm -hmm. I found it interesting. There was a, a moment in the movie where there's someone preaching on top of the hill is saying, you can basically kill an infidel and you'll be forgiven. And they accepted this. And I thought that was really interesting how a known mantra of thou shall not kill um, became the kind of went off to the side in response to a leader's, you know, plan, uh, their crusade to win back in this case, Jerusalem. So I kind of took that with history and some mythology and, you know, notes that I had taken way back when and kind of created this fantasy world. Um, and it always been writing had always been in a good escape for me and a good stress reliever. So it just was natural to eventually write a book. So, you know, I, it's funny because you, you hear people who say, I've got this idea or I've, I've always wanted to write a book, never gotten around to it. I, I've heard that the, the biggest library is in cemeteries of people, you know, who never got, I don't, I don't think I'm saying that right, but you know what I'm saying, Ryan, right. people who just never got around to it. What became that final impetus? Because it, it's, you know, it's only probably been now, what, maybe, what, five, six years? I don't know how long it took you to write the first book, but what what was the impetus and how long did it take you to write that first book? So the first book took me 15 plus years to actually- oh, I'll be darned, okay. Yeah, it was yeah. a, it was an old, so it just happened one day. I was, I can't remember like the actual nugget, you know, that spark that did it. It was, I just had this interesting fable. It might've even been a dream. <laughs> uh, many, I mean, really, I can't, I can't really, yeah. it's so far, it's so long. I mean, I just turned 34 and I was 15 when I started writing anything legitimate. And, um, I remember waking up and just having these different, this huge fable was rolling in my head. It was only a mm. one night dream, right? It, it's, it felt like it was so long. And I always remember, I always loved the, the uh, mythical creature aspects of things. And they were all inside of there. And it was it's interesting. So one day I was like, I'm going to just try my hand at at reading. I think actually after I read um, Christopher Polini's Aragon uh, was was one. I really enjoyed his work. And I said, why not? Let's just go for it. I want to I want to write something, whether it is great or not. No, no idea. <laughs> so I just sat down. I was like I said 14 or 15 at the computer and started writing. Um, and then from that point on to when my first book came out when I was 31, uh, so it took that long, 15, 16 years to finally just get it done. Um, but there was a lot of time in the middle between sure. you know, growing up life experience. Right. Um, I, I realized writing, you know, you really draw from your own life experiences and, uh, I had to live a little bit before I could get better at what I did. Yeah. You know, but it's interesting. You said it took you 14, 15 years for the first, but the second was way shorter, right? Way shorter. So how, you know, how much of that from a confidence level of, okay, I've done one. So I think, you know, is there, you know, there's an increased confidence. There's also an increased, this is how I do it. The process. How, how important was that in writing the second book? Oh, it was pivotal, absolutely pivotal to, to <laughs> writing the second book. The second one, so it's a little novella too. It's a short little guy. It's about 30,000 words where book one is uh, anywhere about 80,000. So quite a difference in just word amount. And the second little novella took me three months. I did it over a summer. 
So I wrote over a summer, got most of it edited. The publishing process took a little longer, but that's okay. It went from 15 years down to about a year. So I improved drastically. Um, but basically kind of imagine, you know, blazing a trail, you know, you're creating, if everyone's gone, you know, inner tubing or, you know, you're cutting through, uh, you know, shrubs or going through a forest, the initial go through to find, make that path is the hardest work. Once you have your, your ground laid, you know where you're going, so much easier. You got your tools, you know, your process better. Now you can refine it and make it better. So it really, that first one, uh, finding my resources, people who have done it before, and right. I trusted, uh, really, really helped with making uh, book two or the prequel and then all my future books um, happen a lot faster. You know, you 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 were kind enough to have me on your podcast, which we'll talk about here uh, during the during the show. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because I think my writing's easy to do. I'm just talking about business. I'm talking about me I'm talking about stuff. I, I'm not making things up at least that's in my head I, i'm i am uh, writing my thoughts i'm writing my my worldview all of that you're actually creating characters you're you've got to figure out uh and i'll just say who done it whether it's a you know whatever whatever that uh who done it is you've got to figure out the journey for those characters my question to you because i've never done this do your characters change? Does the end change during the process? Do you start out with, this is how it's going to be. This is how it's going to end. And does it change? So kind of a yes to all of that and kind of a no to all of that, if that <laughs> makes any sense. And if anyone here has ever written fiction, you'll, you'll know what I mean. Uh, you always go into your story with an open mind. And it's interesting, if you've ever created characters, you'll find that they kind of take on their own personality and the story is very organic. When I go and plan my books, because I plan them, you have to have, I have scenes in my head that I want that need to be there. They are concrete, they are granite. I am not removing them. But the problem is going from point A to point B and so on to the end, those are fluid. So I have to change with the times. Um, characters who I thought were going to be good end up being bad or, uh, you know, end up being very, you know, they're just going to be this straight laced the entire time, end up changing. They get dynamic. So you have to really uh, just kind of go with the flow and then plan ahead. So I always break up my chapters into what I hope the plan will be, the direction we're going to go this way. But think of, you know, a long journey, you get there and you go, there's a huge rock in my way. I now have to backtrack <laughs> and go around. So that kind of happens. You can write yourself into a corner. Well, how do you get out of that? And so sometimes you have to discard something and re-go or split it off and do many other things. And it does, it takes a lot of planning and just note-taking and patience and a lot of work. <laughs> so Ryan, you know, when I, when I wrote any of the books I've written, because there is no necessarily theme through it it's not a story these are these chapters are all stories in and of themselves i will write a chapter i could write this eighth chapter first it doesn't matter because what happens before doesn't really matter And at the end i can if i need to i can i can make adjustments so i write as uh from a stream of consciousness so to speak or whatever however the wind moves me do you have to start from the beginning? It sounds like you're not starting necessarily from the beginning. You're you're putting in those musts somewhere along the line. Do, do, you, do you have to go chronologically? Uh, no, not necessarily. It does help in, in some regard, but again, especially we do backstories. So you okay. want something really important for character development, especially you think your hero, the hero is great and all, you you, you cheer for them. But their backstory doesn't matter near as much as your antagonist. The antagonist drives the story. Oh. If the antagonist isn't doing the bad stuff, the hero has no point in the story. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're, there's nothing for them to, you know, revolve around or, you know, build everybody up to go and defeat or, or win, right? So you have to have that backstory. So I find that as you go and you develop where this person is in the world, you might have to take a step back and develop the backstory. Um, or you might have to create that awesome epic scene in your head, and then you have to cater the scenes prior and post around that story. 
So it really all depends. And on, so on the bad guy is the most, you know, bad guy or bad girl. It doesn't matter. The, the right. bad, the villain, the antagonist. And I guess I start my, my head went to Darth Vader, you know, oh, yeah. that, that, you know, if you look at the whole star Wars, uh, everything, and then what happened before he went to everything, even though you'd think Luke Skywalker, it really revolved around Darth Vader, didn't it? Yeah, actually, uh, George Lucas even admit that it is Anakin Skywalker's Darth Vader's story. Ah. When, you, when you break it down, it yep. is his story. If you go back and look enough at it, so it just it was interesting. To, I've heard other other authors say the same thing, but uh, it's it's a very interesting aspect to it. Well, our story is we've got to pay the bills, and so we're going to take a short break to hear from today's spotlight sponsor. And when we come back with our guest Ryan Oliver for our hot or not section of the show. We're going to talk a little bit about time management. Uh, don't walk away. We'll be right back with more of the shrimp tank. And today, because I don't really have a co-host as a title sponsor, I'm going to talk a little bit to everybody about our brand new patron membership uh, we lovingly call the Shrimp Peelers. And, and I want to invite everybody listening to become a shrimp peeler. Uh, this offers all of the peelers exclusive content. Uh, a weekly, every Tuesday, mini pod uh, that's going to, we're, we're talking about things like uh, uh, employee issues. We're talking about AI. We're going to be talking about a whole bunch of cool things for any business leader, entrepreneur to help you grow your business and enrich your life. So uh, we hope that you'll join us. It's $5 a month. And here's, here's this crazy thing. I'm going to give you a money back guarantee. If after 12 months, you don't get $60 worth of value, I'll, I'll give you your money back. No questions asked. I think you're going to get $60 worth of value in the very first one you listen to. So please go to patreon.com slash shrimp tank Seattle. That's patreon.com slash shrimp tank Seattle. Sign up, become a shrimp peeler and get all of the cool exclusive things that we are doing, all the great content. Uh, we hope to see you on that side. All right. Welcome back to the Shrimp Tank, where we interview the best and brightest CEOs, business thought leaders, and authors in the greater Puget Sound area and beyond. Our guest today is Ryan Oliver. We're going to jump into hot or not here, Ryan. This is where I'm going to pepper you with questions uh, about business, about life, about writing books, about a whole bunch of cool things. You're going to tell me if it's hot or not, and then why or why not. Uh, at the end, you win absolutely nothing. However, I hope I hope you have some fun with it. So I mentioned time management. Hot or not, writing a book with a young, active family and a real job. Hot or not? Oh, absolutely hot. <laughs> okay, but you gotta. So I thought you'd say that, but there's got to be some time management constructs that you've got to build in because somebody listening or watching this is saying, "Yeah, I want to do the same thing, Ryan." But I've got kids. I've got a job. Uh, I got to sleep. I got to eat. How do I do it? How did you do it? Uh, yeah, honestly, the uh, the old fable of the tortoise and the hare. I, I embody that tortoise. Okay, I'm not winning any races here, but I'm getting big projects done in in very slow amount of time. But I'm getting them done in small chunks. When you have a huge project like a a book, a story, anything, the best way to tackle it. Okay, I'll ask you a question. How do you eat an elephant? Uh, one bite at a time, right? One bite at a time, exactly. Yeah. So you take a huge, huge project, break it down into small sections. And then from there, you can break it down even further until you can actually master, have enough time to do what you have to do. So often enough, I usually give myself a word quota when I'm really working on trying to get a book done. Uh, you can be very, very you know, aggressive with it and say you're going to do 500 to 1,000 words, right. which to me, it's pretty aggressive. 500 words, if I can get done in a day, I've done good stuff. Um, the hard part is with, you know, young, having a young family and job. And I do occasionally like to sleep and eat every now and then, um, I made it a hundred words a day <laughs> is, is what I made, made sure I do. That was one. Another one I do is you have the seven day work week is basically how you do it, but you don't do, or I guess a six day work week. Um, I picked this up from my publishing coach, um, Patrick Snow. Yeah, I know he Patrick. Me, yeah. 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 He's a fantastic guy. He knows so many people, great wealth and knowledge. Um, he told me, especially for someone like myself who's just busy, um, he says, take, get up early on Saturday. I already get up pretty early for work. So I get up maybe a couple hours later than I would normally. Get up early before the kids wake up, spend two to three hours working on your book, and then 
put it away and go to what you got to do for the rest of the day. Everyone gets the attention they need. You get, you feel like you've accomplished something and then do the same thing on Sunday. So during the week, when you only can throw maybe a hundred words at something, or you can't do anything at all, you are at least slowly, but surely progressing your way towards a finished product. So Ryan, do you have a process? Cause I know I had to do this stuff comes into your head. It doesn't have to, it can come into your head at any time, right? It, it's not, it doesn't, it's not just in that hour or two or hundred words or whatever. Do you have a process for extracting that in the moment? So you don't forget it. Uh, how do you do that? A notebook. Notebook. Okay. Yeah. I use a notebook. I'll have a notebook on me almost all the time. Um, I'll have my phone with a note app on it to some degree. I have to write it down somewhere and then I'll keep those notes. And then when I do actually have a spare moment, I will open my computer up and I have an entire document dedicated to my notes for the story. And I'll know where I have to put it, what chapter, what story, you know, what, uh, what portion of the book it goes into. So I've got it already categorized. So I make sure I make those notes. And once I do that, I can go about my day and keep being productive. Okay, Ryan, here's, I'm going to throw you a softball for the next Hot or Not. Maybe the first one was too, but here's another softball. Hot or Not, podcasting. Uh, yeah, that's pretty hot too. <laughs> Tell us about you. I, I did that on purpose. I'm teeing it up for you. Tell us about your podcast, how you got started, who you're, who you're uh, interviewing, and how people can find it. Yeah, so uh, the Mighty Books podcast kind of was born out of necessity. Um I, 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 something I, I realized I didn't do very well and I'm not a huge, wasn't a big fan of it first was marketing. When authors become authors, when writers become authors, they realize that marketing is kind of their new gig now, essentially. Uh, most of us don't necessarily like doing that. We want to, you know, uh, keep writing. But something I really wanted to do, I looked at podcasts as an idea. I saw someone say they had started one. It was a good idea. I thought about it. You can perform, you learn a technical skill. Um, you can learn the audio and technical uh, editing portion, all that fun stuff to possibly create an audiobook. book. Uh, Cause I got books and need to get audio book formed. Um, along with that, I've always wanted to talk to more authors. I love talking to authors because we can talk trade and talk shop. I can get information from them. They can get information from me and I network. So my network grows. Zoom has been an amazing tool. So I can talk to people anywhere they're at. It's very convenient for someone like me who's very busy. And then I thought about it. Okay. And the last thing I was thinking about was now people know me as an author and they'll know my books a little more. So it kind of, it kind of helped grow um, into there. Um, and the people I interview are authors, uh, local, a lot of locals, a lot of Kitsap County local guys and gals. Uh, but I found myself finding authors literally everywhere in the greater United States. Um, I've I interviewed people from Alaska, uh, the South, East Coast, Midwest, California, Texas, Hawaii, um, all over the place. And I've even got a couple of people from who used to live internationally in like Germany and in places like that. So I've met a huge amount of people. It's been a great experience. Ryan, in, in all of the interviews that you've been doing, because it looks like you've been doing it for a couple of years now, what are some similarities uh, in authors? Because the authors that you're interviewing run the gamut of genre. Uh, I'm a business writer. Uh, I've seen that you've had, uh, you know, whether they be life coaches or fiction or mysteries. I saw you had a guy who was just talking. Uh, I, I have yet to listen to it, but I'm going to. They Disaster and crisis management recovery looks looks interesting. You've you, They've run the gamut. What are some of the same, what are some of the traits that you see that are consistent? That's a great question. Um, all I'll tell you right now, passion and drive to do better and to grow is number one. I mean, everyone wouldn't be on there being authors if they didn't have a, a, a desire to improve themselves, uh, to teach. A lot of people who, te who are, have written uh, nonfiction have a desire to teach and get the word out there, help people. I mean, that's really what it is. Um, a lot of people have a joy in just what they do. The fiction writers, especially, they love to sit down and write. Oddly enough, a lot of the fiction writers are introverted. They love to sit around and just think about their brainchild and come up with wonderful stories. So it's just, it's interesting. Everyone's got their little quirks and, and niches, but um, many different people have processes that are very similar. 
um, how they publish things, how they create the stories. And it's just been very fun to uh, talk with everybody to see what different nuances. And it's great because there's so many people we've talked to, I've talked to. And if you like this person's brand versus this person, they might be able to help you elevate yourself to be an author that you want to be. So it sounds like from your, your bio, and we talked a little bit about this as we were getting ready to, uh, to, to do the interview, sounds like you might have some interest in coaching authors. This is, uh, this is developing something new. And by the way, Ryan, that's very entrepreneurial. Uh, if, you, if you ask Barb, my wife, uh, I'm coming up with new things all the time. They come into my head. I, I kind of think of myself as a serial entrepreneur, which kind of drives her a little bit nuts. It's like, can you just do one thing at a time, please? Um, can you finish what you started over here? But I, I kind of think I was like, I'm a little bit like a, my Jack Russell, uh, Captain Jack was. It's just, it's not the way I'm, I'm wired. Uh, so this very entrepreneurial. Talk a little bit about what you think you might be looking at in the future with coaching. So coaching, again, kind of, I've always thought about coaching. I'm, I'm I'm kind of a natural natural coach, and I say that because through my other jobs I've had through my through my careers, several uh, or different jobs I should say. Anytime someone new comes in and they want to, they're hungry and they want to learn. I am always happy to go. Hey, this is how we do something. This is how we make it better. Um, and I always gravitate towards those people who want to improve themselves, and I'm happy to divulge that information. Uh, so it just, it makes sense to me. And I've talked to so many coaches lately and I wouldn't be an author right now if it wasn't for my publishing coach, uh, Patrick Snow and several friends now are all coaches. And with talking, when it's funny, when you become an author, you have friends, family, people you didn't even know, all of a sudden they go, I've always wanted to do what you just did. <laughs> right. And so they come to you for questions. Right. And so it's just very natural. I love helping people. I actually really enjoy promoting people. I don't like talking about myself. So this is weird for me. So I love talking to other about other people. Hey, check him out. So coaching just seemed like a super natural um, uh, thing for me to do. And I've thankfully run into a few people who I've offered up kind of a, you know, free, free coaching just yeah. to get them started. And I've been told that especially with fiction, fiction authors, that I'm able to kind of pull out the ideas and really help them brainstorm. Um, a person I worked with is writing this amazing scientific or science uh, fiction story adventure, kind of become a spy thriller thing. He had put it down and hadn't done it for like two, three years. The moment him and I start talking, all of a sudden he's writing pages and pages. So that kind of got my, the juices flowing. So I've, that, that brings me to a thought because I know you're a history buff. I, I was a history major way back when in college. Uh, you know, and I know the genre that you're writing. You just talked about science fiction. Can you see yourself either yourself writing or coaching somebody in a historical fiction? I uh, just, just, you know, one of my favorite, maybe my current favorite book that's not an, a new book is A Gentleman in Moscow. I don't know if you've read that book. It's a, an amazing historical fiction going back to the early, early 20th century Uh Post Bolshevik Revolution. It's an amazing book, but it's it's historical fiction. Could you see yourself doing that um, as a writer or as someone who's going to coach? Either one. Um, absolutely. If I'm, I've always, I, to me personally, I have loved ancient history is one of my biggest all time favorite times of, you know, um, a, a history. It really is just because it's such different, drastically different. You know, it's the origin of things. Origins are always interesting. How did things begin? You know, um, and if someone has, has an interest in using me as a coach and they have a passion for a, a piece of history, I would love to go down that rabbit hole uh, because if there's just more you get to learn, just more you get to learn about an, an area, a person, uh, culture, whatever. It would be a dream come true if I got to help someone do a historical fiction. It'd be, it'd be amazing. Well, what's not fiction is we've we've got some great sponsors and we're going to take a, a second short break to hear from our corporate sponsors. And when we come back with our guest, author Ryan Oliver, for our plead the fifth section of the show, excuse me, we're going to talk about character building. Don't walk away. We'll be right back with more of the shrimp tank. And plead the fifth is brought to you by our great corporate sponsors, Ideal Life 360, Cornerstone Financial, First Underwriters Insurance, BC Fitness Studio, Upstart Group, and 
Port Ludlow Resort. Please visit our website at www.shrimptankpodcast.com slash Seattle to learn more about these terrific companies. Okay, Ryan, uh, plead the fifth. If you've listened to our show at all, you know I'm going to turn up the heat here. I'm going to, I'm going to, I got a whole bunch of sports metaphors. I'm going to throw curveballs. I'm going to do all of that stuff and uh, we'll see. I don't think you're going to fair catch. See, there's another sports metaphor, but you can, you can plead the fifth. If we get to one, you got to plead the fifth. You can do it once, but after that, the gloves come off. See, I got three sports metaphors in there in about two sentences. So I've got that going for me. Okay. I'm going to talk about character building. I'm thinking about the characters in the book, not you. Plead the fifth, Ryan. Are any of your characters based in whole or in part on anybody in your life? Oh, absolutely they are. <laughs> yes. Uh, can you can you expound exp expand on that a little bit or expound as well? So um, I'll just say right now, a lot of the big, big characters who make huge impacts are based off those from leaders in history that I you know, don't know. Okay. But the, the ones you get kind of intimate with and actually learn a little about, they are excerpts and portions <laughs> of my inner, inner, inner family, my nuclear family. Um, my younger brother, Chris, is him and I's relationship is, is, very, is pretty darn strong, I will say. And we are very sarcastic witty and we like to rag on each other because it's what brothers do yeah um and so i i have a character named magnus who's just a big hulking individual very smart but people think he's not so smart and he loves to rag on people his per his his personality his how he interacts people very bluntly um that is directly from my younger brother and i've told him and he this. knows it too i'm, I'm oh. guessing he yes he, he knows is, it I have, to, I've been told by my mother who I've said, this is based off of my brother. She's like, he can't die. He <laughs> cannot die. And so I laugh and I, of course, <laughs> joke quite often that he's going to get really hurt and he might, he might not make it. And of course that really irritates her. He thinks it's hilarious. Uh, so, um, you know, that is, that is. Does he ever come to you and say, okay, next book this is what Magnus is going to have to do. I'm, I'm, I'm throwing in, you got to have this happen. Does that happen? Oh yeah. He, he's definitely done that. He's got to do this. He's got to do this. He's my, actually, he's my sounding board, uh, which really helps me because I need sometimes to have someone throw ideas back at me, Yeah. but it's, uh, it's story security because he's got a terrible memory. Uh, this is him telling me this. He's got a terrible memory. I'll tell him something. He'll forget it. Um, after he helps me out. So it works out very nicely, uh, but he's a, he's a joy. So Ryan is, I, I, I got to ask this, this could be a plead the fifth. Is your wife a character anywhere? Uh, a, a little bit. Yes, actually there is, <laughs> there is a, a female, I've told her this too. Uh, okay. There's a female character uh, who is plays with, or works with the um, one of the main antagonist or uh, protagonists. And my wife is a very strong willed there has her opinions and she is right a lot of the time i mean i gotta give her credit like you know some people say they're right but she comes back with logic and evidence and she can be very witty too so anytime i have uh her interactions with my main character her 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 face comes to mind when i start writing for her so it's all good all good stuff all good compliments she's just fun to write for because i mean i live with her so it's just a it's an interesting <laughs> character oh, dynamic. That sounds that sounds fun. So yeah. here's something that's fun. Plead the fifth. I'm gonna have to think about this a little bit. If you could have dinner with anyone, dead or alive, who would you have dinner with, and and what would you guys eat together? What you know, you could you could you could either go to a restaurant, you can you can uh, have coffee or get a cafe. You can you can make dinner yourself. But who who would you share time with, dead or alive? Oh my goodness. Um, well, I, I do enjoy a, uh, Nikola Tesla. His, his backstory is, is interesting. Um, I don't know where we'd eat, what we'd eat. Uh, but just, just picking his brain as to how he handled all the triumphs and losses and ingenious inventions he came up with. I mean, he's basically the backbone of our electrical infrastructure, um, AC versus DC. I was an electrician in the prior life. So it's, it, he would be a fantastic person to talk to. He's got a car being, you know, named after him for, well, he, does. <laughs> he, he doesn't know it, but he does. He doesn't know yeah. It, yeah. yeah. But yeah, he, he would be one. I'd love to just pick his brain and ask, get his story from him. There's many books written about him. 
but from him because I mean he didn't end his life in a good in a great standing he was kind of older and penniless but I mean he had probably the amazing stories from developing his incredible inventions life-changing inventions so Ryan, we you know we all know that we can sometimes be our own worst critics. I got to believe authors are no different. Uh, would you sh- plead the fifth? Share with us something that you struggle with. Oh man, um, yeah, I definitely struggle with with the imposter syndrome. I guess you'd say is, and if you don't, I haven't heard that before. Oh, I, I think everybody listening to this has has, has heard about the maybe <laughs> suffered. We've all suffered from it at time ourselves, but. Uh, Please continue. Yeah. Um, when when you first start out, especially when starting, you know, as as young as I was, uh, reading, going back and reading your work, you really want it to be good. Uh, a, it just it if it doesn't interest you, it's like what's the point? It's not going to interest anybody else. But I definitely have a hard time when once something's written to go back and reread it because I get in my mind of what I just wrote is hot garbage, and now I have to either. And I have to start asking myself the question of why am I doing this? No one's going to want this. So that kind of just constant backslide, uh, you know, self-deprecating uh, uh, thought process always comes up. So I, I have so, to. Yeah, I want to talk about that. Like, if you don't mind, I'd like to expand on that because I, 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 everybody probably at some point suffers a certain extent of that when you're writing. And this was just something I'm, I had a flashback to me at some point you you have to say this is good enough at some point you you know because if you if you're always nitpicky and 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 working on it and and trying to make it perfect it's never going to get done and uh in reality not only is it good enough the people reading it might think it's fantastic how do you deal with that um okay it's down on paper, even though it's, you're probably looking at a computer screen, it's down on paper. I've looked at this, I've reread it. I've uh, gone through it. Maybe I've even had it edited by a professional and maybe we can talk about that. But at what point do you, do you know it's good enough? Um, at that, that point you have poured over it. Um, usually you've, you've had your first, you know, your first draft, always your worst and that's okay, but it's understand being reflective and knowing that it's okay. You have to get used to the idea of perfectionism is out of your reach. You can get reach for perfection and, you know, aim for perfection and reach excellence. So you want to reach that excellent marker. And with the help of multiple people, whether it be your alpha readers, so the guys and gals who read your book prior to editing, your beta readers who are those who read it pre-editor, and then your editor you want to kind of surround yourself with those people a you trust and will give you good constructive criticism and you can you know you can be vulnerable with them about your stories and your maybe your shortcomings so it gets to the point where you've poured it over enough you feel like it is a good product and you have to just kind of get comfortable with the fact of take that leap of faith it's got to get out there sometime you can always fix it that's a beautiful thing you can always pull it back retract it fix something so having that as kind of a little mental safety net really did help me finally take the leap and, you know, publish as, as good as it can get. Okay. Last question. Uh, it's been a lot of fun, Ryan. We'll probably have to have you back on the show here soon. Uh, what's your uh, one piece of advice for somebody who says, regardless of the genre, I want to write a book, uh, but I haven't gotten around to it. Can you give them one piece of uh, encouragement? Well, for starters, if you are on it and you want to do it, make time to do it. It's not going to get done by itself. And even if you are not a very good writer, you still want a story to tell, tell it. You can always edit a, a bad manuscript, but you can't edit an empty page. You know what? This has been so not empty page. This has been a great, great uh, uh, podcast. I've enjoyed it immensely. Ryan, thank you for being on. Uh, hopefully you'll come back and join us later. And uh, I can't wait to, I, I, I got to dive into your books. I, I literally, I have to admit, I haven't read them, but I'm going to. So that's, that's a, that's a promise for me. So uh, before we go, tell people how they, more importantly, how they can read your books and how they can listen to your podcast. Yeah. So we'll start with the podcast. Uh, the podcast is currently on YouTube. It's just audio right now. Uh, YouTube, so Mighty Books, you search Mighty Books, it'll come up. 
Uh, we're up to uh, aiming at close to 50 episodes so far. So 50 separate authors and interviews. Um, so mightybooks.com or uh, YouTube, Mighty Books. Uh, you can also go to Spotify, Apple Music, and Audible on Amazon and find us there too. Uh, as for my books, you can go on to ryanmoliver.com and you will find uh, both books listed there and the Mighty Books uh, link as well. And if you ever want to chat with me about coaching or scheduling an interview because you are an author, you can go to the same website, ryanmoliver.com, and you can actually schedule a time for us to chat. Beautiful. Uh, thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, best wishes on the next book, and we definitely will stay in touch. Everyone, uh, make sure that you go to all of those platforms or one of them and like us. Uh, you can catch all of the replays on shrimptankpodcast.com slash Seattle. Uh, wherever you get your podcast, we're all over the place. We are on iHeart, Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud. We are also on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Our next show, which we live stream, will be on Wednesday, June 21st. Our guest will be Danny Steiger. He's CEO of Lumber Traders, Inc., Monica Blackwood will be my co-host. In the meantime, be safe, be well, be prosperous, and, and start reading Ryan's books, why don't you? Because until next week, the shrimp is back in the tank. So long. I've been feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank.